Good afternoon. It is a great privilege to be joined here in these historic chambers by former and current colleagues as we pause to honor the memory of 60 former senators who have passed from our midst, each held in high esteem and respect. Today we also extend a special welcome to the family and friends of our former colleagues who are present. Would everyone please rise for the presentation of colors led by the Wentworth Military Academy and College Color Guard. Please remain standing while Senator Wayne Wallingford leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now please remain standing as our color guard leaves the chamber. Reverend James Earl Jones will provide our invocation. Let us pray. Lord God, you are a refuge and strength of every present help in time of trouble. You remind us in the book of Ecclesiastes, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time for joy. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in whose hands are the living and the dead, we give you thanks for all your servants who died while serving the state of Missouri. We have set aside this time in your presence to commemorate their lives. Guide us in your love and mercy as we remember and give honor and respect where honor and respect is due. May the good memories of these, our friends, colleagues, family, and loved ones, serve to inspire us to a, a better life in your sight and for the benefit of all we serve. 
We pray that their faith, love, passion, and legislative accomplishments are spoken of and emulated for years to come. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us and blessing today's events. Now, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace comfort our hearts and establish us in every good word and work. For in his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. The choral senior men from Jefferson City High School will now sing Shenandoah. Have some very honored guests. We're sitting at my left, 
and I do not have that page, so pardon my, uh, my, my slight pause, but I don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, on the bench to my left, uh, honored to have here with us today uh, our governor, Jeremiah J. Nixon. <laughs> Former governor, Christopher, Christopher Kitt Bond. Former Governor Roger Wilson. <laughs> Former Governor Bob Holden. <laughs> Former President Pro Tem John Scott. <laughs> Former President Pro Tem Jim Mathewson. Former President Pro Tem and Mrs. Charlie Shields. Otherwise known as Brenda. Brenda, thank you for being here. Former President Pro Tem, I saw him here, Rob Mayer. There he is. Senator Mayor, you're not hiding the uh, Speaker of the House, are you? Okay, Speaker Tim Jones uh, was supposed to be here today. Former President Pro Tem, Mike Gibbons. Is there anyone else? Okay, we're good. Thank you. A former senator from Bates County, Harold Caskey, is known to have requested to be on the floor of this historic chamber upon his passing, noting that nothing is ever truly dead in the Missouri Senate. While this request was, of course, a comical reference to the tendency of legislation once thought to be dead to be suddenly revived in the closing days of session, it does nonetheless contain a hint of truth. I'm happy to say that Senator Kasky is still with us today. To walk upon the floor of the Missouri Senate is to walk in the steps of great men and women who've served here before us. Their memories do indeed live on in the customs, the courtesies, the rules, and the lore of this august body. The Senate has often been referred to as a family. Perhaps that reality is nowhere more evident than here today as we see such a large and diverse assembly gathered together to honor those men and women who came before us in this chamber. Public service is a noble calling, and in many ways, a sacrifice. Few know that better than the family members who don't make headlines, stand in the limelight, receive plaques, awards, or accolades, but nonetheless have made their own sacrifices so, so that a loved one could serve in the Missouri Senate. Many of you know what it is to single-handedly fill the role of two parents, to be alone at school functions, sporting events, and social activities, to put on a brave face through missed birthdays and lonely anniversaries, to take on extra responsibilities and manage the best you knew how as you shared precious years with your husband, wife, father, or mother with the citizens of the state of Missouri. To the many family members gathered with us today, we extend our warmest welcome and heartfelt thanks. I've spent the last 16 years in public service, the last 13 of which have been in the Missouri General Assembly, representing the people of St. Charles County. During that time, I've come to more fully appreciate the fact that we who currently are endowed by our citizens with the title of Senator do indeed stand upon the shoulders of giants who have served here before us. In fact, only slightly more than 1,000 men and women have had the distinct honor to serve in the Missouri Senate in our state's long history. It is a humbling realization to recall that we are not the first legislators to sit in these seats, nor will we be the last. Many senators before us debated measures and ideas on this floor, some that have changed Missouri forever and moved our great state forward. Today we are remembering those former members who have offered their intellect, their passion, their ideas, 
and indeed some of the best years of their lives as an offering of service to their beloved state of Missouri and its people. In the history of the Senate chamber, in the event of a death of one of our colleagues during session, a single white rose is placed on the late senator's desk. Today we will, we will continue that tradition as we honor those former senators who have gone before us by placing a rose and lighting a candle in their memory during roll call. As we reflect upon the lives of these men and women and the contributions they made to the state, we also remember the intangible qualities they brought with them. The 60 senators we pause to honor hailed from every corner of the Show Me State. With them, they brought a wealth of diverse thought, culture, custom, humor, and personality. They were not only leaders sent to Jefferson City by their neighbors to hold a position of trust, but they were our mentors, our friends, and over time have become our family. In Jefferson City, success is too often measured by power, prestige, and position, by legislation passed, or battles fought. However, when our time here has passed, perhaps we will come to measure success differently. Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, to laugh often and love much, to win the respect of intelligent persons and the affection of children, to earn the approbation of honest critics and to endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to give of oneself, to leave the world a better, a little better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to have played and laughed with enthusiasm and sung with exultation, to know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. <clears throat> I recognize some of our special guests. I would also like to recognize our former members who are in the chamber visiting, who are taking part in this ceremony today. Would all the former members who are in attendance in our upper gallery please stand? We are honored by your presence. Now I would like to introduce a man who knows more about the history of the state capitol than perhaps anyone in Missouri. Of course, this should come as no surprise. Rumor has it that he was actually present when the cornerstone of the edifice of democracy was laid just over 100 years in 1913. <laughs> there are also other rumors involving this indiv individual and the, and the mysterious fire that destroyed our previous Capitol building that once stood on this very site. But he offers a strong alibi, claiming that he was covering the historic flight by Overall Wright in North Carolina at that time. Such is the respect for this aged stage that most historical accounts now attribute the fire to a lightning strike. Regardless of what actually transpired, it is my pleasure to introduce Missouri's own Mr. Bob Pretty. <laughs> Bob has had a distinguished 40-year career in Jefferson City. In those 40 years, he's interviewed every governor since John Dalton, countless legislators, and other newsmakers. Bob is currently the news director of the Missouri Net, a statewide commercial radio network that provides news, sports, and special program due to, to about 60 stations in Missouri. He's written five books on Missouri's history, and he's led numerous efforts to open Missouri's government to its citizens, creating the first gavel-to-gavel -gavel internet broadcasts of Florida debate in the Missouri House and Senate. He's one of the few people who have ever touched the ceiling of the House and the ceiling of the Senate, he claims that's why he's always had such a high aspirations for both chambers. Bob, thank you for being here today. I did not start the Capitol fire. 
and I don't remember the Wright brothers' flight, but I am getting old. When I was asked in November to speak at this event to deliver some remarks, I was initially rather reluctant to do so because I felt that the Senate should memorialize its own and should draw from that event some context that might be useful to those who now are here. But as the pressure from Senator Richard grew, and more importantly, as the pressure from Ms. Spieler grew, <laughs> other factors entered into the consideration. And when Terry gave me a list of those that we honor today, I realized something important. I realized that I knew, saw, or had talked to almost two-thirds of these people, including a couple who served in this legislature before I was even born. Second, one of the lamentable facts about the unfortunate imposition of term limits is that not one of you in this chamber now ever served with any of them as a colleague. You never once had to live up to the expectations they had of you to be a senator. Some of you might have known a few of them while you were in the House, but not one of you ever had to measure up to their expectations of you in this chamber. Most of them served in the pre-term limits era, when longevity brought a certain level of wisdom to the General Assembly and to this chamber when corporate political memory was an important guide to those who served here, a guide to the policies and the behaviors of those who serve, when there was a time for arguments and positions to be tempered and to be refined within that climate. I studied the list a couple of weeks ago, and I came up with the total number of terms that these people served. The average was 2.7. It was a Senate where decorum was paramount, where the senior members taught the rookies never to refer to lady or gentleman during debate, and the lessons were so well taught and so well learned that it did not happen. It was a Senate where the presiding officer seldom had to use even a tapping of the gavel to remind violators of professional courtesy or other mistakes that had been made on the floor things which were not treated as some kind of a game. Most of them did not have the fine meeting rooms that you now have on the first floor. Some of them had a small meeting room and a larger meeting room and many meetings were held in the Senate lounge before it was turned into a hearing room. The Senate lounge in those days had a platform at the north end with a large table on top of that platform and I remember the night that the Senate held a hearing on the Equal Rights Amendment, when the room was so crowded, probably violated most of the fire regulations in the city at the time, and I ended up halfway under the table around which the Senator sat, trying to cover the hearing, while those who spoke spoke from the witness table right in front of me. It was a table that was inhabited by many of those we honor today, Senators Schechter and Lee, and Manford, and Dinger, and Spradling. They were all among those who were around that large table, hearing the Equal Rights Amendment, which probably had no more chance of passage then than it does today if it were to come up in this chamber. Some of you might identify with Senator Schechter, who recalled for the State Historical Society of Missouri some years after leaving this chamber, I was healthy when I went into the Senate, I had perfect heart, good blood pressure, and then during the Senate years, my heart started to miss, my blood pressure went up. My doctor asked me if I intended to run for the Senate again, and I said, why? And he said, if you do, you'll never make it. You'll never last another four years. And that's why Senator Schechter left in 1976. He and Senator Hess had served together in the House of Representatives in the 1930s. Senator Hess recalled for me several years ago his interaction with Thomas Hart Benton when Benton was here painting his famous mural in the House Lounge, and Benton's interest in the horse and dog racing bill that, Senator, that re then Representative Hess had gotten through the House, which was then vetoed by Governor Guy Park. Senators such as Senators Schechter and Hess were aware, as you are all aware, of the special role that the Senate plays in the two chambers of the General Assembly and the relationship of governance here. 
They were, they were pleased to relate the story, as I'm sure many of you have related it, which we might note, by the way, has no historical record to indicate it actually happened, of the conversation between Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. It is a nice story anyway, and if it's not true, some would say it should be. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson sat down together. Jefferson asked Washington why he agreed to have a United States Senate. And Washington supposedly asked Jefferson, why did you just now pour your coffee into that saucer before drinking it? And Jefferson replied, to cool it, my throat is not made of brass. And Washington replied, even so, we pour our legislation into the senatorial saucer to cool it. Or to put it another way, in a phrase that was said then by your predecessors, and I'm sure has been said by some of you, at least thought it, the House passes the bills, the Senate passes the laws. Generations of members of the House, and those of you who have been in the House, perhaps might have been part of those generations, look upon such lines as a conceit of the State Senate. They look upon it as a statement of superiority, maybe even a dismissal of the House's work. But to be honest now, you understand those lines better now that you're here, don't you? Those we recall today knew those lines too. And this generation is bound together with those generations by those attitudes. You share a culture that they created. And it is up to you to continue that culture and to pass it on to the next generations. Perhaps someday you might pause while you're in the hallways and look at some of the photographs of the predecessors that are there. And you might realize there is a link between the people in those pictures and you, a connection. You might understand the responsibility that their spirits entrust to your generation and that you will pass along to others as they passed them on to you. They fully understood and they protected the phrase that we occasionally hear today that everybody is a senator, a phrase that demanded then and demands now respect among equals and a shared respect for this chamber and the disciplines that encourage passionate but collegial behavior and the special role the Senate plays in balancing the interests of the General Assembly. They served in a time when senators came into the chamber prepared to debate bills and had the capability of drafting their own amendments, which sometimes was a major problem for the people who sat down here when the amendments were brought forward and they had to figure out exactly what that scrawl really meant on that piece of paper. Some of these 60 people voted to create what are now the Pershing Galleries and the Bingham Galleries and the Kirchhoff Gallery. And why did they do that? Because they wanted a buffer between the chamber and the people in the hallways who were asking them to do things for them. They would create such a noise when they opened the doors that it was hard sometimes to hear the debate in a Senate that at that time did not have a public address system. Many of you will remember B.W. Robinson, who was the doorkeeper over here on this side for many years. I was told just a few days ago that he once said his first job was to stand at that door and keep the lobbyists away from it so that the Senate could conduct its business in peace. Most of those on this list of those we honor today could not have anticipated a time when the cell phones are openly consulted during debate and when the voices of those in the hallways are no longer insulated by the galleries on the side. The galleries were built to help keep the business of the Senate in the Senate and among the senators. Technology has erased that buffer zone to a large degree today and with it a certain sense of independence that the Senate had. Now let there be no doubt, these 60 that we remember today, these 60 were familiar with the interests that were represented in the hallways. And from time to time, they were not above carrying their water because they knew, as you know, how the system operates. So we need to be cautious in some of our rose-colored remembrances of the past in this capital and in this chamber. These 60 who sat behind the desks you now occupy, these 60
sat behind desks that had been occupied back as far as 1919. You share space with them. They were no greater humans than you are now or those who served before them. They served with varying degrees of distinction, we must be honest. Not all of them left willingly. Some voted in loud and clear voices, and a few were such mumblers that the clerks down here would often have to ask them to repeat their votes just so they knew whether it was I or nay. Some were more competent than others. I recall, for example, one afternoon when a senator who is not among those that we are, that we are honoring so badly messed up a motion to adjourn that the Senate debated it for 45 minutes. <laughs> I have not seen such a fumble on an adjournment motion since then, but I have seen many senators struggle with the basic motions to be made for the advancement of a bill. The ability to debate at, debate at length is still with us every bit. The challenges of working with the other chamber across the hall, across the rotunda, or working with the governor were similar to those today. The rivalries between the House and the Senate were not much different then when the relatives of those who are with us today served. The involvement of governors in the process varied widely then as it does today. It was not uncommon, for example, nor was it uncommon to see Governor Carnahan out here in one of the galleries working on a problem with a bill. On the other hand, some of us can recall that there was a senator here from the governor's own party one day who referred to Kid Bond. There were 60 people now who are pictures in the Senate hallways, as you will someday be. be. Only a few of us here today, only a couple of us who regularly inhabit the press table, saw most of these 60. Only a few of us can recall their voices. But some of us can look around this chamber and in our memories, we can see them at their desks again. And we can visualize them rising. And in our minds, we can hear their voices. Senator Jet Banks, who sat over there, kept a small podium on his desk when he was the majority floor leader, the first minority floor, majority floor leader in the Senate's history. He kept a small stand on his desk, a podium, so that he could more easily read the calendars and other materials that had to be kept track of during the session. And for those of you who think that seersucker suits are just the greatest thing in the world, you are rank amateurs compared to Jet Banks, who began a, who began a custom when he was still in the house on the final day of the session of bringing several changes of clothes with him to the chamber, to the House and Senate. And several times during the day he would change and he would come to the floor dressed in colorful but tasteful attire, coordinated down to the shoes and even in the days when smoking was allowed in this chamber to a pipe the same color as his shoes and his suit. Senator Earl Blackwell was a legendary figure who served here from Jefferson County. He once landed his light plane on a road. He and some of his young Turks took over the Senate for a short time. He said he didn't want the governor to dominate the Senate the way the governor dominated the House in those days. He served a tumultuous time as president pro tem. He later admitted that he might have upset more people's apple carts than any other pro tem who ever came along, which is one reason why there used to be a picture of another senator out there in the side gallery who was a pro tem, J.F. Patterson, who succeeded Senator Blackwell when the Senate decided it was time for him to leave the pro tem job. It is a reminder, it is a reminder that, that power has limits. And sometimes when power is overstepped, there ultimately is a reckoning. But he served with distinction. He served with great passion. I don't think, I don't think I ever saw Senator Phil Curls in a hurry. He sat down here. He was probably the best ambler that I ever saw in the state Senate. He always was a free and easy person walking in. I don't recall him ever raising his voice, but I do recall there were times when there were steel in his words. Senator A. Clifford Jones, who sat on the aisle back over here, didn't like to spend money redecorating his office, and he was here long enough that he could have done it several times. 
He had little tolerance for those who did not know what they were talking about, either in committee meetings or on the Senate floor. And he was especially short-tempered with someone who did not know what was in a bill that he or she was sponsoring. He and several other veteran senators of his, of his time did not suffer fools gladly on this floor. Senator Jones was a classical scholar, as well as a scholar of the law and the legislative process. He was appreciated because he spoke only when it was important to do so, and when he spoke, what he said was important. Senator Lawrence Lee sat over here, an intimidating presence for a young reporter. He spoke directly in a baritone voice with a touch of the rasp in it. Unfortunately, and this is the case with most of those on the list, he served in the days before debate was being recorded. And because of that, we have lost a powerful speech he gave when the legislature reenacted the death penalty. The memories of those remarks are faint now, but the impression of them remains. Two congressmen are on the list today, Robert Young and Ike Skelton, two very different men. Robert Young, who sat over here, was a union pipe fitter from St. Louis who served with a gritty blue collar spirit that was born of his profession and his history of a man who came under fire at Omaha Beach on D-Day and was serving with Patton's army during the Battle of the Bulge. And Ike Skelton, whom I remember over here, a rural county prosecutor at one time, who did much of the work the last time the criminal code was rewritten, which was at a time when it only took about 400 pages to write the criminal code. That's almost short enough for the governor to sign it. <laughs> As I recall, Senator Skelton was elected to Congress before the bill was put in its final form, and Harry Wiggins, who also is on our list today, was the one who carried it to its final passage. Senator Wiggins, who sat back there, was a gentle soul who was dedicated to his royals, his chiefs, and to his city. He was the last of the Kennedy New Frontier Senators to serve in this chamber. Others might have appreciated wearing the title of senator as much as Harry Wiggins did, but I don't know of anybody who's ever served here in my experience who took such pride in wearing it as Harry Wiggins did. When a terrible nursing home fire in Farmington killed 26 people in 1979, Harriet Woods, who was down here, led a fight to reform Missouri's nursing home regulation laws. And she also crusaded for tighter drunk driving and home health care laws. And she returned to this Senate to become its president when she was lieutenant governor. One Sunday evening, I was driving back from St. Louis on I-70, and I had my car set on a cruise control at four miles an hour above the speed limit, and a Cadillac went flying past me. And I immediately recognized the platinum blonde hair, even before I saw the license tag that said S5. And I knew it was Paula Carter. And so I decided to see just how fast she was going. And she kept going faster, and faster and faster. And finally, after we turned off to Kingdom City, she pulled off to the side of the road. And I went past her, and the next day, she came up to me in the Senate and wanted to know why I was following her. <laughs> and she kept trying to outrun me, and finally gave up and got my license number when I went past and checked with the highway patrol. <laughs> we laughed about it, I called her Speedy after that. She and people like Senator Larry Jean Taylor are people whose potentials as senators will forever be unknown because an insidious disease took them to us from us far too soon. It wasn't that many years ago that the majority floor leader's office across the hallway here was known as Club Ronnie for Ronnie DePasco because of the hospitality that was available there. He too left us too soon because of illness. Some of the stories told by some of those we recall today reflect that while members of the Senate might change, some of the arguments and some of the issues don't. Senator Dirk, who sat over here, was straight-spoken and gruff sometimes. He sometimes thought the media was the cause of a lot of the problems of the Senate. I never argued with him about that. His most important accomplishment, though, out of the 400 bills or so that he calculated that got to the governor's desk that he sponsored, was the seatbelt law. It doesn't sound like much, he once said, but that thing has saved more lives than any other thing I could have done. We look at the results of that bill today, and some unfamiliar with the same legislative attitudes might wonder why 
Only Senator Dirk and 17 of his colleagues voted to approve that bill in this chamber when it finally passed. And it got only the bare number of votes in the House, 82, to reach the governor's desk. And even today, we hear some of the same arguments on other legislation that were made against the seatbelt law. Government shouldn't go around protecting us from ourselves. Thousands of people are still with us today because the government, in fact, did protect us from ourselves that day. Senator Downs from St. Joseph was known as a man of unvarnished straight talk, frankness and bluntness. He once referred to a prominent citizens group that had people up in the galleries one day as the League of Women Vultures, which they didn't much appreciate. He recalled the day that he and other candidates for his Senate seat were summoned to Kansas City to meet with a political action committee that would decide which of the candidates to put money behind in the upcoming campaign. And he recalled growing increasingly uneasy during the interrogation as he quickly determined what the committee wanted. What the committee wanted was an increase in the sales tax. But an income tax, no, we don't want anything like that, he said. At the end, the committee asked him if there were any issues about which he wanted to bring to them. And yes, he said, one of his counties had a major environmental problem caused by industrial dumping, and he asked this political action committee if they had any ideas about the best way to approach that subject. And not one member of the political action committee responded. And so Senator Downs told them, you ask me down here to see whether I came up to your standards, I'll tell you this, you don't come up to mine. And he got out and left. It was the end of the interview, but it was not the end of the career of Senator John Downs. I used to often fear as I read a news story about Senator Omer Avery that I would get the first letters of his name confused. I am often on a trivia team with Senator Briggs's great-grandson. I used to deliver communion to Senator Jim Strong's mother, and remember when he was beginning his political career as a city councilman in Jefferson City, as many of you began your political careers as city councilman. It would be easy to go on and on about many of these people and many others, and I hope that in not mentioning them, I do not indicate any lack of recognition or respect for them and their service as senators. This is, after all, a recollection. It's not some kind of a filibuster. But speaking of filibusters, let me mention one senator who was unique in all of the years I have watched this body work. All of the days and all of the nights and all of the early mornings, when those of us in this chamber heard the words, would you like to know, Senator? We knew we were about to embark on a meandering journey with the greatest storyteller I have ever heard in this room and in this building. Sometimes it would be about a racehorse named Trixie. Sometimes it would be about his school teacher mother in horse holler, or his father who was a salesman for Raleigh Products. Once there was an offer to take another senator out of the rotunda for the administration of Shimshannon County Justice. Once there was a story of a truckload of Volkswagens that he drove from New Orleans to Omaha in which the tops of the cars were scraped off by a low viaduct. Would you like to know, Senator, said Danny Staples, early one morning, I believe, as he and Senator Doyle Childers were killing some time on a bill, perhaps, I don't remember what it was, perhaps it had something to do with rooster fighting or building a stadium in St. Louis. Would you like to know, he said, about a snake that got into the family chicken house down in Eminence when he was a boy. How big was that snake, Senator, said Senator Childers? who sat in the front row over here. Oh, said Senator Staples, who sat back there. It was about seven chickens long. <laughs> Filibusters used to be much more fun in those days. And they were rarer. Those we remember today were people. That's what I really wanted to get across. They were people who cherished the title of senators, but first they were people, as you are. You can find the formal record of their service here in the old journals and old newspaper accounts, and maybe the occasional films or recordings of their interviews that have survived for the decades. 
While some might feel that they felt a greater responsibility to the title of senator than some of us sometimes wonder about today, we need to remember that they were like your generation. They were people and they were citizens who felt called to service for the betterment of the people of the state of Missouri. They sat where you sit today, behind the desks you occupy today. Senator Dirk was once asked by the State Historical Society of Missouri if there is a place in today's politics for idealism. Oh, absolutely, he said, absolutely. You have to have high ideals if you're going to be a success. You can't go in there looking as to how you're going to benefit yourself. If you do that, you're going to be a miserable failure. You just can't do that. And Senator Downs said in his interview about idealism, God help us when it's gone completely. Well, we know it's not gone. It's here. But he reminded the interviewer of the day a powerful political action committee summoned the candidates to Kansas City and the answer he gave that political action committee. There are two kinds of services that mark the passing of those who have served, whether in the Senate or elsewhere. One is a memorial service. The other is a service of remembrance, and they are two different things. Two distinctly different things because of what they do and because of what they symbolize. Memorials are not designed to simply mark the passage of someone through life. They recall the timeless values of those being memorialized and what they stood for. For the enduring values that provide guidance to those who would shape a society after them. A service of remembrance only acknowledges somebody was here, but requires no call for commitment from those who have followed to respect those values and maintain them because those principles remain valuable and eternal today. Tomorrow's behavior of this generation of senators will determine whether this service honors honoring these 60 or only remembers them. And perhaps in that process, this generation of senators might ponder whether their own presence in this chamber should someday be memorialized or only just remembered. An ancient Egyptian proverb once said, to speak the name of the dead is to make them live again. In a few minutes, the names of these 60 former senators will be called and one final roll call in this chamber for them. And for a brief second, for a brief second, when someone answers present on their behalf, they will live again in this place. It will be up to each of those who respond on their behalf to decide if they are only remembering them or if they are memorializing them. These 60 deserve more than just being remembered. And so I hope someday to those of you who share their desks on this occasion. Bob, thank you for those wonderful remarks. I want to take a second and uh, recognize our Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder, who was able to join us uh, for the ceremony today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, <laughs> Governor. For our second musical selection, I'd like to invite Senators David Pierce and former Senator Scott Roop up to the dais. Thank you, Senators, uh, to sing Amazing Grace.
Thank you, Senators. We will now have our traditional roll call. Family members, please stand when your Senator is called. Now, Mr. Clerk, call the roll. Senators, Avery. Banks. Barrow. Here. Bass. Barra. Build. Blackwell. Bondurant. Here. 
breaks. Carter. Curls. Curtis. Dennis. The Pasco. Dinger. Dirk.
downs. Easily. There. <coughs> Gibson. Gilmore. Heflin. Hess. Horn. Oh, sure. Here. Jones.
journey. Let a hand. Make it. Madison. Manford. Mar. Miller. Mueller. Pat. 
Panathir. Patterson. Rosier. Schechter. Skelton. Southern. Spencer. Spread. Staples.
strong. Sunderworth. Swinton. Taylor of Jackson. Taylor of Stone. Titus. Trepler. Van Landingham. Welliver.
Wiggins. Wilson. Woolsey. Here. Young. Once again, here's the Jefferson City High School Choral Senior Men singing, Tell My Father.
I would like at this time to recognize the members of the Memorial Committee. Senator Ron Richard, Majority Floor Leader. Senator Mike Kehoe, Assistant Majority Leader. Senator Jolie Justice, Minority Floor Leader. Senator Kiki Curls, Assistant Minority Floor Leader. Thank you for all the effort you put into making this a very beautiful ceremony. I'd also like to thank everyone uh, who, who was able to join today. We're lucky to belong to such a wonderful Senate family who's made, who's made it possible for their loved ones to serve the people of our state in the Missouri Senate. Now, if you'd all please stand for our benediction by our Senate chaplain, the Reverend Carl Gawk. I received the benediction. God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all for attending today's memorial service. I'd like to invite all family members and friends to a reception immediately following the ceremony in room 326, the Pro Tem's office.